أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل رجهم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My dear brothers and sisters I hope everyone is doing well I hope everyone is uh, is benefiting as much as they can from the rich content um, that our great brothers and sisters are sharing. I highly advise you guys not to just watch this lecture, but watch the other lectures that are uh, being uh, displayed for you. They're very, very rich and uh, you know the content is great. I highly advise it. Jazakumullah khair. We'll begin today's lesson or session, sorry, with the Lord Sabbath ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad wa ajjil barajahum. Yesterday, my brothers and sisters, we began discussing a topic that was titled, What is God? We began the topic by asking, What is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And we began by saying the question has premise because this idea of God being something and the question surrounding the being of God, the essence of God, is an issue that many, many religions have discussed and many discussions and even conflicts began because of what constitutes God and what is God and what is the essence of God? Who is God? Do we understand God through logic? Can we not use logic to understand God? Do we just use the scripture and how do we understand the scripture? Do we use it? Do we take it, sorry, through literal terms or do we understand it in metaphorical terms when it's speaking about some sort of physical reality to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We came forward and we presented the different ideas that are there about God first, beginning with the polytheistic religions, such as Hinduism, in which they don't believe in one God, they believe in many gods. And these gods come in various forms. Some of them are human hybrids, others are purely animals, others are purely human beings sprouting from different myths such as Greek mythology, etc. And you can go into history and you can see. Now we said we don't want to discuss too much about them because they don't really link to mon monotheism and, and the Abrahamic faiths. But when we look into the Abrahamic faiths, just the same. When we look into the Old Testament, when we even look into the New Testament, we find that God is depicted having a physical form. God is depicted in having different body parts. More than that, God is depicted as a human being and that humans were created in God's form and God's image. We found that this idea of human beings being in the image, the physical image of God is one that the Bible and the other scriptures really focus on and allude to time and time again. We saw that in the Bible, it refers to an, a story where Jacob apparently wrestles with God and Jacob doesn't get subdued by God. Rather, he subdues God. And after God being subdued, he blesses Jacob. And this instance or this event that happened, this story is used as a moral story to struggle with God and come out on top and, and, and go get through the hardships of life, etc., etc., etc. Then we moved on and we asked the question, Tayyib, this depiction of God, is it found in Islamic ideas is found in some islamic groups as well in the theories of some islamic sects we said yes rather rather you find that many sects many groups many people in the past and even today believe that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has some sort of physical form to the degree that islamic scholars gave them a name gave such groups a name and they called them al-mujassima Al-Mujassima, they gave them a name. They grouped them together and they called them Al-Mujassima. Just like they grouped other groups, other sects that believe in other things and gave them a specific name for their belief in that specific issue. Jamil, who are the most prominent of them? We called them the Ash'ara, the Ash'ara, which are the majority of our Sunni brothers and sisters today. Obviously, the majority of them, the laymans don't know these things. The, the scholars do. When you go to the scholars' books and you talk with the scholars, no, they're very clear on this issue. 
So if you ask them, where did this come from? They said the Quran, and it came from a literal understanding of the Quran and not a logical understanding of the Quran. And we went through this. طيب. Then we moved on and we said that the ahadith that are found in our Muslim, our Sunni brothers and sisters books, they not only, they not only speak of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having a physical form, rather some of them are copy paste what you find in the Bible. Where if we went back, if we go back, we see that, for example, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, what does God say? So God created mankind in his own image. These are the words. So God created mankind in his own image. When we go to the works of, for example, Sahih al-Bukhari, he narrates, عن أبي هريرة أن النبي قال خلق الله آدم على صورته. God created Adam in his image, not in his way. It's not like they changed the words a little bit. It was literally right click, copy, right click, paste. Simple. Just go to Google Translate, translate it into Arabic and throw it in our books. Now, today, my brothers and sisters, we're going to ask another question. Keep on going with the topic. And that is, where did these ideas come from? As in, as in, how did they make their way into Islamic literature? It's one to say, it's one to say that some Muslims hold these ideas, but not to find a source for them within our books. We can say they were influenced by external sources. As in, if we had a scholar that came and wrote in his book, God, God is in the image of a human being. We'll say, you, this scholar was influenced by people of other religions which is normal. Human beings can be influenced by other people. But when it comes to the hadith of Rasulullah, this hadith is saying the Prophet said, not Abu Huraira said. Abu Huraira narrates that the Prophet said. Like when we find that the sources of the Sharia, the sources of the religion are said to have said, are narrated to have said such things. As in the sources of the religion are telling me that God has, apparently, God has an image. And his image is that of a human being. We ask, how did such a thing happen? How was our literature poisoned to the point where the prophet himself is narrated to have said what is said in the Bible? Copy paste. How did this happen? Then we're going to explore what the Shia said about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and how some of these different Quranic verses that are brought up as shawahid, as proof for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having a body, how do our imams alayhim salam describe them, or how do they trend, how do they give, how do they explain them? That's the word. How do they explain them alayhim salam? And then when you see and compare, when you see and compare how Ahl al-Bayt alayhim salam understand the Quran, understood the Quran, and how the Quran is explained by some of the Ashab and some of these riwayat, you're going to truly appreciate, my brothers and sisters, the path that you are on. And that's the practical aspect behind all of this. To appreciate who you are, what you are, and what you follow. Inshallah, we'll get through all of this bi'awnillah ta'ala. But before it, Allah sallallahu ta'ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Tayyip, first question. How was our literature poisoned to this degree? Where we find in the literature of the Muslimin, copy-paste from the Bible. How? My brothers and sisters understand this. Let's talk history. When the Prophet ﷺ passed away, he was martyred. Obviously, things didn't go well for Ahl al-Bayt Amir al-Mu'mineen was sidelined. Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salam was killed in her home. Sayyidah Fatima passes away. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam is in his home. His involvement with the Islamic government becomes limited. His khilafah usurped and taken away from him. Jamil, Jamil, stay with me. But we know very well that in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, in the words of Rasulullah, in the sunnah of Rasulullah, Amir al muminin was not only mentioned once or twice or three times, mentioned many times, mentioned to a point 
where normal layman's person, layman's people, layman's Muslimin would know of Amir al-Mu'minin Ali bin Abi Talib. Many, many ahadiths before Ghadir Khum. Ghadir Khum was the stamp on the letter. You write an entire letter at the end, you put a stamp. Ghadir Khum was but a stamp. The letter was written in the last 23 years of Rasulullah's message. From the very beginning, from the very beginning, when Rasulullah gathered his family members, he appointed Ali Amir al-Mu'mineen as the Khalifa. In the very middle, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam was also appointed as the Khalifa. Even the word Ali yun Khalifa was used. And you find these in the books of the brothers and the sisters. And at the very end. So you find that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa life, his narrations are, 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 are abundant in Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Not only his fadail, not only his merit, but also, also, in the fact that Ali is going to be the Khalifa after Rasulullah. Jameel. You, as someone who is taking the government away from Ali bin Abi Talib alayhi salam's grasp, you are trying to take away the chair of Ali ibn Abi Talib. You can succeed in doing so politically. You can take Ali ibn Abi Talib and put him in a jail cell. But you cannot succeed in doing that ideologically. You cannot succeed in doing that in a way where you strip these ahadith from the minds of the people because they know them. You can't play the propaganda war against the likes of Ali bin Abi Talib because everyone knows who Ali bin Abi Talib is. You can only win the battle. You can only win the battle. But propaganda against Ahl al-Bayt will not work because they are known and the hadith are known. So what am I supposed to do as the new Khalifa? Ali bin Abi Talib is in his home. But everyone speaks of Ali bin Abi Talib. And everyone knows Ali bin Abi Talib, who he was. And it's like the elephant in the room when I'm sitting on my pulpit and I have my nose to the sky when I'm sitting amongst all of the ashab. The issue of Ali bin Abi Talib sitting on this chair is the elephant in the room. How am I going to take that away? How am I going to erase that? I can't erase what's in the minds of the people. So what do I do? I stand up on the pulpit. And I say, you are not allowed to narrate the hadith of Rasulullah anymore. You know them, you know them. But the only way, only way you can cause me a problem is if you revolt. And you can't revolt by yourself. You need someone else to revolt, revolt with you. And the key to your revolution are these ahadith, is this turath, is the sunnah of Rasulullah, are the hadiths of Rasulullah. If you are not sharing them amongst yourself, there's nothing to spark your revolution. Cunning. Cunning. Jameel. The ahadith of Rasulullah were abandoned. They told the people not to narrate from Rasulullah anymore. Under what excuse? So that the Quran does not get mixed with the hadith. Jameel. When the people are not narrating anymore the hadiths of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They are not narrating what has influenced them to change their entire lives where a man and a woman were, were probably living in Jahiliyyah for 40 some odd years. And so Rasulullah comes and changes and flips their entire life Oh, When that same messenger is gone and those in power are telling us to forget him and what he taught, what are those people going to do? What are those people? They're going to go back. انقلبتم على أعقابكم if Rasulullah goes, are you going to turn back? Yes, they will, because it's human nature to turn back. It's human nature to go back to what you've been grounded in. So they went back to the time of Jahiliyyah. And in the time of Jahiliyyah, who were considered to be the wise ones? Who were the people of wisdom? Ahlul Kitab. The people of the book. Those were the people of wisdom. The Arabs held Ahl people of the book at a very high level. And they used to take from them. And they were influenced heavily by them. Not just influenced, influenced heavily by them. Even the prominent, prominent, prominent companions, even those that became the Khalifa later on, were influenced by them. Not after the Prophet's death, during the Prophet's death. 
during the Prophet's death. Look at this hadith. I narrate this hadith from a Sahih min Sirat al Rasul al Adam sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam by Sayyid Jafar Murtad al Amali rahmatullah alayhi. For his soul, let's have a loud salat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Look what he says. Look what he says. He says, as for Umar, at the time of his Khilafah, and even before that, Wallah al -alam, whether it was the time of Khilafah or before, he used to always go to a city called Masika. In that city, there were many Christians and many Jews. There were many people from Ahl al-Kitab. And he used to go to them and speak to them and listen to what they had to say. To the point, to the point, أَنَّهُمْ زَعَمُوا أَنَّهُمْ يُحِبُّونَهُ أَنَّهُ يُحِبَّهُمْ يُحِبُّهُمْ لِأَجْلِ ذَلِ Meaning that they felt that he loves them and likes them because he always goes to them and takes from them. وَقَدْ جَاءَ عُمَرْ بْنِ الْخَطَّابِ إِلَىٰ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَعَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ بِتَرْجَمَةِ التَّوْرَاتِ he came to Rasulullah one day, Umar ibn al-Khattab. He came to him and he said, this is a translation of the Torah. The Torah, the Torah. And he started to read it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as he's reading, the Prophet's face was filled with anger. وَقَالَ لَهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَعَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ لَقَدْ جِئْتُهُمْ لَقَدْ جِئْتُكُمْ بِهَا نَقِيَّةً بَيْضَاءً I came to you with this religion. I came to you with it. Pure and white. وَاللَّهِ لَوْ كَانَ مُوسَى حَيًّا مَا وَسِعَهُ إِلَّا اتِّبَاعِ By God, if Moses was alive, he himself would have followed me. He himself would have taken from me. They were influenced heavily by the people of the book. And when you take away the only influence that's caused the person to change and flip his entire life, they're going to go back to what they know. They're going to go back. Like, that's one influence. That's one reason. Second reason, the likes of, the likes of Abu Huraira and Ka'b al-Ahbar, the narrators of the hadith play a huge role. Because this person that's coming and saying the prophet narrated to me one, two, three, and four is essentially the way, the medium between you and the prophet's words. Yeah, and there's if the prophet وسلم, was going to say something to me and you, the medium between me and the prophet was this individual. And so we study this individual. We ask, who is this person? Who is this individual? Are they trustworthy? What is their past? What was their life about? Are they adil? Are they just? Are they trustworthy? Are they liars? Were they known to be liars? And so when we find a hadith saying such as خلق الله آدم على صورته Adam was created at, in, in God's image or God was created Adam in his image we don't go to Rasulullah and say Ya Rasulullah what are you saying? The first person we go to is the narrator. طيب, when I read, قَالَ أَبُوْ هُرَيْرَةَ Abu Huraira says, the Prophet said, I don't go to the Prophet here and, and I say, Islam is telling me. No, no, no. Let me go to Abu Huraira. One sec. Who's this guy? When I see Ka'b al-Ahbar said, one, two, three, four. Let me see who this person is. And what's funny, by the way, this خَلَقَ اللَّهِ آدَمَ عَلَى صُورَتِهِ Both, in both narrations, it's from Abu Huraira. So let me ask him a question. Who's this Abu Huraira individual? Who is this Ka'b al-Ahbar individual? You find this name a lot, Ka'b al-Ahbar. Abu Huraira was an individual, was a man that became a Muslim in the last three years of Rasulullah's life. Jameel. After Rasulullah, what, is, what did this man do? After Rasulullah, this man was in close contact with the Umayyads, was in close contact with the Khalifa, was in close contact with the people of power, and subhanallah al-azim wa bihamdih. This same individual that had such ties with the Umayyads, had such times with such high ties and hard ties and strong ties with the Khulafa, this same individual apparently narrates over 5,000 hadiths from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 5,000 in three years. These ahadith, my brothers and sisters, and many like it, are found with the likes of Abu Hurairah. 
and Ka'b al-Ahbar, who was a Jew, was a known, was known to be a Jew, became a Muslim, apparently. Became a Muslim. Maybe the last few years of Rasulullah's life, God knows when this man became a Muslim. And these ahadith started to make their way into Islam. One of the easiest ways to prove that some of these individuals were liars was to just look at the ahadith that they were narrating. Aside from, aside from these disturbing ahadith, just go into history and see. For example, it is said Abu Huraira narrates from Ruqayya. Ruqayya, the daughter of Sayyidah Khadija alayhi salam or another Ruqayya that was alive at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa dhani annaha, annaha bintu Khadija and I'm, I'm, from my understanding it was the daughter of Sayyidah Khadija or the niece, sorry not the daughter, the niece of Sayyidah Khadija alayhi salam Allah, sorry not the daughter, the niece of Sayyidah Khadija, Jameel. It is said Abu Huraira narrates from Ruqayya, Tayyib, when did Ruqayya pass away? They say she passed away in the Battle of Badr. The Battle of Badr. Yani pretty much halfway into the Risala, the message of Rasulullah. Tayyip, when did Abu Huraira become a Muslim? They say after Marakat Khaybah. After the, the Battle of Khaybah. Yani was Ruqayya even alive when Abu Huraira was narrating from her? No, she was dead. Tayyip, how is he narrating a hadith from Ruqayya? Blatant lie. I don't have to even look into all this. This is objective. I don't have to look at these ahadith and say they're lies because they go against my aqaid, my beliefs. It's going to history. Blatant lie. She was dead. How are you, how are you narrating from her? You find these individuals made their way, my brothers and sisters, into Islam and started, and started to poison Islam from within. And not just this. They were paid off, some of them by the Khulafa, the Umayyads were known to do this, to pay money to people to stand up on the pulpit, to stand up on the pulpit and speak ill of Ahlul Bayt, to promote the Khulafa and to spew lies. They were known for this. They were known for this. And this is the result, my brothers and sisters, that God apparently walks to Rasulullah, gets closer to him. That God is in the image of a man. That God, in other ruwayat, you find Shabbun Amrad, a man with no beard, a 13-year-old man, no beard and curly hair. Yes, absolutely yes. Yes, the, this is just the surface. This is just the surface. And Al-Aqil, the intellect, is thrown in the garbage. We are to be literal with the Quran. Taib, why? Subhanallah al-Azim wa bihamdi. Tayyib, let's come to Ahlul Bayt. Come, come, let's come back to Ahlul Bayt together. Me and you, let's come back to Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam What did Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam teach us about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is? Simply put, simply put, Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam taught us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not defined by a what? The question is wrong. The question is wrong. He is the one that made the what, what. And so what doesn't apply to him. And he is the one that made how, how. And so how does not apply to him. He is over what and over al kayf how. You can't describe God by saying what is he and giving an answer. You can't describe God by saying, how is he and giving an answer. He's above this. He's above all of these things. The question doesn't apply. What do I mean the question does, doesn't apply? You're running away from the answer. No. The condition for me providing you with an answer is that the question applies. What do I mean by that? I'll give you an example. I'll ask you. I ask you. You see that Lamborghini that you have parked outside of your house? What color is it? And if you actually have a Lamborghini, then Bugatti. You probably can't have both at the same time. That Lamborghini that you have parked outside your house, what color is it? You tell me. You tell me. I don't have a Lamborghini. That answer is not a color. You didn't provide me with a color. I'll give you another one. 
the red Lamborghini, is it parked outside of your house? Yes or no? It's a binary question. Yes or no? Is there a third option to yes or no? You tell me, well, I don't have a Lamborghini parked outside of my house. So the question doesn't apply. The question of color doesn't apply. We say, we say, la al-su'al. There's no application for the question. When it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's no application for the question. It doesn't even apply to God. There's no what and how when it comes to God. And this is what Imam Radha alayhi salam says. He's the one that made the how, how. He's the one that made the where, where. This is Ahl al-Bayt alayhum salam. Not this nonsense. Not this nonsense. Ahl al-Bayt alayhum salam. That's Ahl al-Bayt. When it comes to logical inference, when it comes to the way we look at this logically, very simple. Number one, Allah Ta'ala can't have a body. Why? Because by saying God has a body, you have to put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in an envelope of time and space. And by putting a God in an envelope of time and space, you've confined God. And by confining God, you are essentially saying he's not, he is limited. He cannot be unlimited. He is not infinite. Rather, he's finite. He's in this place. Me right now with the body that I have, I take up a certain amount of space in which you cannot put something else in the space that I occupy. You can't. It's physically impossible. That means there's a piece of space, space that I occupy on a Cartesian plane, X, Y, Z. Zero, zero, zero is what I occupy. You can't put something else in my place of space. But for me to say that I occupy a space, an envelope of space, I have to be on a Cartesian plane. I have to be on a playing field. I have to be in something. Well, space doesn't apply. Perfection means infinity in every regard. When it comes to his attributes, subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it comes to his actions and when it comes to his essence. That's why we say, People think that that verse means nothing's like God. No, that's wrong. Nothing is like his likeness. It's not that nothing's like him. Because me and you, nothing's like us. We are unique in how we are. Even if you got someone that looked exactly like me, spoke like me, and screamed at this laptop in the way that I scream at the laptop, it's not going to be me because I occupy a space and time that's different from him. We are all unique. So there's nothing like me is a correct statement. For me to say it to God is wrong because then there's nothing different from me and God. There is nothing like his likeness. There's nothing like the likeness of God. And this is the example I like to give for my students when we talk about Al-Ahad, the unique. The unique. If I say there's one God, what does that actually mean? I'll give you an example. Let's say on this table, there's one water bottle. Is it the same exact thing as me saying there is one, one Bugatti? That they have only created one in the world of, in the parking lot outside. The word one here in terms of the water bottle and the word one in terms of that one Bugatti, that one car that they've only created one of it in the entire universe of. Is the word one here, does it apply the same for the water bottle and the car outside? No. Why? Because one here is just one in number. There are many other water bottles outside somewhere else. But it just happens to be that here there's only one of them. In that parking lot though, that car, there's one of them in existence. That means if you go somewhere else to another parking lot, you're not going to find that one car. So the idea of one for the water ball is so different than the idea of one for the car. Jamil, Jamil, stay with me. But the car itself, that same manufacturer can take the, the plans for that car and make me another one. 
And if the other one came into existence, it doesn't threaten the existence of the one that's already here. Yes? Jamil. When it comes to God, his oneness is even higher in level than the example of that car. Why? Because if there was someone like Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you have to for sure say that this thing that I pointed to as God was not actually God. In other words, he ceased to exist. Because God himself, the meaning of God, means that nothing like him can exist. And if it does exist, then know what you're pointing to is not God. If he exists, if both of them exist simultaneously, then know what you're pointing to is not God. Nothing is like the likeness of God. Subhanallah. Where are these hadiths from what we just said? From the hadith, the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt. Sayyid, we've confined God. That's one reason. Second, Second, is this. By me saying God has a form, has a body, then I'm saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is comprised of parts. Because every form can be split up into different pieces and parts. Whether, whether that is physically, mentally, in your imagination, or even hypothetically, even conceptually. Let's say I had a diamond in my hand. A diamond cannot be split into different parts or it's very, very difficult to do so. Yes, Jimmy. If we have a diamond here in front of us, you can't actually split it into different parts. You can't take a knife and cut it into pieces. Yes, Jimmy. But can you, in your mind, conceptualize you cutting that diamond into different parts? Absolutely. So that diamond logically speaking conceptually speaking can be split into parts but just because of its physical nature i can't because of its hardness i can't but in reality conceptually hypothetically i can jameel allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if i was to say he has a form then i am saying that he can be split into parts and if allah ta'ala can be split into parts then i ask the question what came first god or the parts What came first, God or the parts? If I was to say God came first, then where did the parts come from? If I was to say the parts came first and they came together, then God didn't exist and came to be. Oh, now we're caught in a rock and a hard spot. Between a rock and a hard spot, where do you go? It's illogical. It makes no sense. It cannot work. That's why you find the hadith of Ahl al-Bayt, alayhum as -salam. When it comes to these ayat, when it comes to these ayat, we find Ahl al-Bayt gave us meanings that we ourselves didn't even think of. And when you read them and you say, Allahu Akbar, why didn't the Muslimin just follow Ahl al-Bayt? Look at this hadith. This is Tawheed al-Saduq. Tawheed al-Saduq, a very, very good book. I highly, highly advise the brothers and the sisters to pick it up and at least read a few of the, the hadith that are in it. It's the hadith of Ahl al-Bayt specific to Tawheed. عن أبي حمزة الثمالي قال قلت لأبي جعفر عليه السلام أبو حمزة الثمالي narrates he says I said to Abi Jafar Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam قول الله عز وجل كل شيء هالك إلا وجهه tell me about the verse that says everything will go to demise, will dissolve, will disappear. Everything will be destroyed except his face. God's face. That's the apparent meaning. The apparent meaning. The Imam responds. Everything will be destroyed and God's face will stay. Now, the wajah will stay. Let's stay there. Let's not use the word face because it's translated as face. But let's use the word that the Imam alayhi salam used. Wajah. The wajah will stay. Inna Allah azza wa jal a'zamu min an yusafu bil wajah. God is higher than to be described as having a face in the way that me and you understand the face. Walakin ma'nah. 
kullu shay'in halikun illa dinah rather the meaning is that everything will go and become nothing everything will be destroyed except the religion of god why wal wajh alladhi yu'ta min in the direction that god that god is gotten to through is arrived at through the direction of god will never be destroyed after everything else is destroyed the face of god his religion his religion will not disappear and be destroyed let me make it clearer to you as it with an example if i was to look at you how would i know you you threw your face if you cover your face i can guess but i won't know who you are until you show me your face yes jimmy so i can safely say that the way that you know someone is through their face yes tell you the way that you know god how is it through what through his religion so the religion of god is like his face what a beautiful meaning now is this exactly what the imam alayhi salam is saying through al wajh through direction you can understand it in this way you can understand it in this way that god has a face not that god has a face like me and you or no his, he has a face but not like the faces nonsense nonsense absolute nonsense my brothers and sisters when you come to the ahadith of ahlul bayt alayhim salam you see something totally totally different totally different my brothers and sisters and similar are the other ahadith for example the hadith or the 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 the, the verse that says that as samawat the skies are folded in his right hand the imam alayhi salam says his right hand is not his physical right hand it's not a physical thing they are folded in his qudra and what in his power his ability his might they will be folded and held by him not in his hand but by his might by his ability by his power by his strength subhanallah look at look at what you find in these books and look at what you find in the words of ahlul bayt be proud of who you are this is the point be proud of what you believe in and be proud of the imams that you adhere to and when we stand up when we stand up my brothers and sisters and call ourselves shi'as let us do it with pride that's the practicality behind this to give you pride in who you are to show you and also to show me the ahl al-bayt alayhim as-salam are people that us even as westerners even as westerners and i'm almost done but us even as westerners we can be proud to be a part of their shi'a we can be proud to adhere to them call on the name of ahl al-bayt even in these lands even in the west here because if me and you can resonate with them everyone else wallah al-azim can resonate with them don't just hide don't just hide what you believe in and let it be in your mosques people brothers and sisters don't allow our religion just to be confined by the four walls our religion should not go into in the streets and only call, call for human rights because islam tells us to call for human rights we should not my brothers and sisters just go with the flow and say yeah well islam said that too no create the path there's a difference between me walking on the streets and saying islam said this 1400 years ago and we are with you in what you're calling for and i guess compared to me going down in the streets and saying ahlul bayt taught us this 1400 years ago and we are here making the path we are here cutting through the fields we are here making the path known not that the path is already cut we walk on that path and say ahlul bayt alayhim assalam taught us this 1400 years ago That's a disgrace to us my brothers and sisters that somebody else beat us to that path. 
when we had this 1,400 years ago. The point that I'm trying to make here is don't confine my brothers and sisters Ahl al-Bayt to the four walls of our mosques. That's not where Ahl al-Bayt belong. Ahl al-Bayt belong everywhere. Everywhere. In the universities. At work. In the parliament. Everywhere. We need to take this surah, this Ahl al-Bayt, the narrations of Ahl al-Bayt, everywhere we go. It's not only Saturday nights that we listen to a lecture. No, no. Allow Ahl al-Bayt to seep into every inch of our lives and the, and, and the places that we live and every inch of the West. Their teachings should resonate with everyone in the West. And it's on us to show that to them. It's on us to propagate that, my brothers and sisters. It's on us to spread it. This is the point. Be proud, be proud. And you cut the way. Don't confine them to the four walls because that's not where they belong. It's not where they belong. Rasulullah was not a mercy for me and you. Rahma lil alameen. Not the world, the worlds. Not the two worlds, the worlds. Alameen is a plural. And in Arabic language, the plural is for three plus a multiple worlds for everyone. Show them this and you, I swear to you, they'll come running. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم أسأله تعالى يعفو عنا ويغفر لنا ويرحمنا إنه نعم المولى نعم النصير وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهر